Thank you. Thanks so much uh, and welcome to this session, how to be inclusive by design. I'm going to start by handing straight over to my colleague Donna to introduce us both today. Mute, unmute, okay. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We are Hector Minto and Donna Sarkar. I'm Donna Sarkar. I have a uh, long dark hair, light brown skin, and I'm wearing a colorful dress that I made myself with giant pockets. Ladies will appreciate. Hector. Hey, I'm Hector Minto. I'm the accessibility evangelist for Microsoft uh, on a technology, the technology and the investment that we make on disability inclusion and accessibility. I'm a white middle-aged guy with a graying, slightly longer than usual beard. I think this is lockdown. I'm wearing dark glasses. I have a bald head. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, by the way, both of us spend way too much time on Twitter, so that is probably the best way to get a hold of us by far. Even our boss knows to find us, ping us on Twitter. You'll get a response in like a minute versus email, which will be like two days later. True story, true story. So I'd like to kick off by setting the scene. We live in an ever connected society. Society is digitally transforming before our eyes. So much of what we access as consumers, as citizens, uh, as customers of businesses around the world is done online, is done through technology. And the more that we as human beings start to increasingly rely on technology, we need to be starting to think much more about the diverse set of humans that we aim to serve. It's no longer good enough to say our clients look like this. Yeah, we, we have a preset idea of what somebody looks like and how they use our product. People are using technology in many, many different ways. And those customers and those technologies, I would say, that are built with a diverse set of humans in mind are the ones that will win. We're here today to share why accessibility and disability inclusion is not just the right thing to do, the moral thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do. Yeah, you know, it is absolutely going to set you apart from your competitors. We already know this as Microsoft. Increasingly, customers are coming to us and buying Microsoft products because they allow them to be inclusive as workplaces. Uh, and we shouldn't run away from the fact that this is a great commercial opportunity. People used to go to work to use technology. Nowadays, people wake up with technology under their pillows, and that includes the one in six people on the planet with a disability. Companies that can do more should. As Satya Nadella has said time and time again, our mission is what we orient around. We aim to, we aim to empower every organization on the planet to achieve more and every person on the planet to achieve more. We think that we can build technology that benefits everybody, not just the select few who have access to it or the select few who have traditionally had access to it. This is a huge opportunity for us to empower people. And when we think about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, it's obviously a chance for us to really you know, jump into those and try and understand them more. More accessible elections, more accessible education, more access to lifelong learning. These are all things that we should aim for as organizations, but making sure that we're tackling the gap between those who have and those who have not. Technology is reaching further into society than ever before. When we think about how we reimagine a better future, accessibility doesn't, sorry, disability inclusion doesn't just sit on its own. As a company, we are committed to many different parts of what we call social responsibility. Many businesses are thinking about their own ESG goals right now. How do they impact the environment around them? But also when we think about the S in ESG, the social component, what role does our technology have in inclusion, in equality, in electoral rights, in education? So much of these technologies will become critical to people's success in life, their inclusion in the society that we're aiming to build, but only if we deliberately go after it. There's a saying in our world, in the, in the disability space, that if you don't deliberately include, you will unfortunately exclude. 
Or <laughs> to, to think of somebody else, uh, Donna's already mentioned our boss, she always says, if you don't know you're accessible, you're not. <laughs> yeah. So it's this idea that this isn't an accidental thing. Now, everything we think about when the, the UN talks about its SDGs, these are commitments. And what a commitment is, is a deliberate act. It's a deliberate act towards achieving that goal. And we think through this amazing scheme that our, our partner network have, have pulled together, there's an opportunity for us to scale the impact that we have. I'm forever telling our partners, we can do so much as Microsoft to impact the world around us, but the people building their own product, the people deploying Microsoft products, unless you become confident on disability inclusion and accessibility, we will only reach so far. So not only are you our scale as partners, innovating with your own ideas in this space, but you are also our reach. You really, you really allow us to reach everybody in society with the things that we're trying to achieve here. So what is accessibility? Well, fundamentally, it's just creating better experiences for everyone, everyone. Look around you. When we think about disability in the modern world, 70% of disability is hidden, but one in six, and sometimes people now say one in five, of the general population have some form of disability. Accessibility throughout my career, I've been working in this space for 25 years, believe it or not, uh, but if we think about it through my career, we, we used to think about building niche technology for people with disabilities. Accessibility nowadays should not be left just to the specialists. No matter what technology you are building, you have the opportunity to build it for everybody or a few. And doing it for everybody requires some thought. But as we're going to show you, hopefully, within the next 40 or so, minute, or so minutes, uh, it's absolutely going to, uh, you know, create difference between what you're, achieve, what, what you're delivering and what your competitors are delivering. Do you want to buy the inclusive product or the non-inclusive <laughs> product? Ask yourself that question. So, as I say, I've worked in assistive technology for so long, and I can, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a history lesson to help you understand maybe where some of this started. Think back to when newspapers were the default way of getting the news each day. I mean, some people obviously still love a newspaper. I do. I love a physical newspaper. But so much of what people learn now about the world that's happening around them is through social media, it's through news sites. But back in the 1990s, it's not that far <laughs> ago, uh, the picture on the left here is of a, a pneumatic page turner. It's essentially a green button here that you would press. So somebody would press that with their head from left to right or their chin, or they would push their foot down on that pedal, which would then get a vacuum pump to suck the page up on that newspaper. And then a car aerial, we don't even have car aerials anymore, Donna. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody pulls their car aerial out anymore. But back then we had car aerials as well. Uh, and the car aerial would swoop round and turn the page on the newspaper. And that was viewed as kind of cutting edge assistive technology. On the right here is like one of these gyro wheelchairs. That's not, it's partly about getting people up to social height in their wheelchair to have a face-to-face -face discussion, but it's also for getting down stairs. That wheelchair is designed so that if you cannot access somewhere, it will actually rotate you up the, up the, uh, up the stairs, which in principle sounds like a fantastic idea, right Don? Oh my God. <laughs> if I look down the stairs and I'm in this wheelchair, I would no. Just it's terrifying. It looks like a ski lift. Yeah. yeah. I, I sat in this and went oh. down a demo set of stairs at an exhibition. And honestly, you could put me on any roller coaster in the world. Yeah. This was worse. Oh. Yeah. Because fundamentally, it's what it's trying to do is design ourselves out of an in, of an inequality. It's like saying, well, these are these stairs here. We cannot possibly change the stairs. So let's build this innovative piece of technology that gets us around the problem. And my challenge to you as technologists listening to this today is that's kind of what we're doing at the moment. There is great digital assistive technology out there that offers magnification, color filters, all of these different things that will support somebody with a disability to use technology. But fundamentally, what we're still doing is essentially designing workarounds to allow people to access tech. We've got to do better. 
we can do better and we are doing better. You know, we've made great strides in this over the last few years. Take this presentation. For years, if you had wanted somebody to give you closed captions or subtitles in a call like this or in a meeting like this, you would have had to bring in the professionals. Now, just hit the three dots and you can turn on the captions. If you're watching this in the live session, what you can also do with these slides that are presented through Teams is you can translate them into your first language. If you have low vision and you're watching this or you prefer a dark mode or a high contrast mode, you can also convert my slides right away into a high contrast mode because we have put these features into our product inclusively. We have recognized that that need is there in our presentation software. So let's think about how rather than these workarounds, we can start to more inclusively design experiences that just work for everyone. What is the equivalent to the stairs that an architect would design into a building design beautifully yeah, to just allow routine access for everybody. And how many more people would it benefit? Not just the wheelchair users, it would benefit many, many more people in society. I know, Donna, you're going to cover that in a, in a moment. So inclusion drives innovation for everybody. We do not want you to attend this session and to think, how am I going to make special tools for special, in inverted commas, people? People with disabilities are us. We are all people with disabilities. Uh, one in six will you know, have a disability, but many of us will become disabled through life. And actually, many of us are situ situationally disabled at some point. We just want the thing that works well, like on, on the picture here, the bendy straw. The bendy straw was designed by occupational therapists to allow somebody who couldn't position the straw to have it positioned in the precise position for them. Just a smart bit of design that really just helps everybody. And guess what? Everybody started using bendy straws. Yep. The, uh, the can opener here, uh, this is the OXO brand. I don't mind naming the brand. This absolutely revolutionized can opening. <laughs> what used to be a horrible experience, including for people with physical disabilities, suddenly became a delightful experience. I mean, I don't know how about you, Donna, but the first time you ever used that can opener, you were like, I, I, I was shocked it was so easy. I'm like, well, you just do this and you're done. Yeah. It's not like you're giving yourself carpal tunnel with like the old school one. Or you stab yourself with the <laughs> yeah, knife, right. which yeah. was used to be my solution. People are like, how are you opening this can right now? It's not, that's not how it's done. But sometimes Magic. when accessibility lands like that, mm -hmm. you know, what you think is, oh, wow. Why was it, ne why was it always so difficult before? Why, you know, why did we not do this sooner? Well, this was driven through, again, occupational therapists looking at this horrible experience for people who were elderly in the community, and they designed the OXO range with OXO to just make can opening easy. Suddenly, guess who became the market leader? Yeah. OK, subtitles were designed around people who are deaf or hard of hearing, go into any sports bar in the world, and if the captions are not on, just doesn't make sense having the TV on unless it's sport, you know, <laughs> you know, unless it's just the, the baseball. But even then, people want to read the captions, and these are getting so much better. Speech to text. I remember when I was looking at um, voice control for people with severe physical disabilities, so things like spinal cord injuries, ALS or motor neuron disease, uh, we were looking at voice control for home automation. Well, Guess what? That's a normal part of everyday experience now through your phone, through your smart speaker. Essentially, these are technologies that started in the disability space. We all benefit when we when we focus on inclusion and looking at who's unable to use the existing system. What we're really talking about here is that constraint drives innovation. If you as a design team are told you've only got so much budget or you're only going to be able to work in certain markets, yeah. Or you're going to only going to be, uh, you're only going to have a, you know, you're you 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 you're designing for kind of only one particular type of people, yeah. What it does, this constraint kind of makes you think differently, yeah. What we're trying to say here with inclusive design is embrace some of that constraint, yeah. Think about how you could create an amazing thing by problem solving around an exclusion and then extending it beyond. Thinking about another group of people who would benefit from this that you've made. We're gonna go into some uh, examples of this throughout, throughout the hour. Start thinking about, wow, did that really start from a lens of disability? 
you know, yes, this is what we're going to go through in the next uh, in the next period. So with that, I want you to, before we hand over to Donna, to think, also remember you have a completely new set of tools. We don't live in a world where you get a CD in the post. We live in a world where your product can evolve over time. We, have, we sit in a world where we have speech to text, text to speech, image recognition, natural language processing. When we think about the cloud and Azure, AI, you have an opportunity to increasingly rethink your product and rethink it around a specific audience. Uh, you have a new toolkit, essentially. That, back to you, Donna. All righty. So, we, you know, Hector's talked a lot about how constraint drives innovation, and um, we've we've been really focusing in the media around like you know AI driven development and all of this stuff. But I will tell you, one of the most interesting things about accessibility is that it touches every single aspect of technology or design, actually. Whether you're an architect designing a building, whether you're a fashion designer designing clothes, whether you're a technologist designing you know, UX surfaces, accessibility affects all of you. And as soon as you keep designing for people, for and with people with disability in mind, you're just gonna build a better thing. It doesn't matter with a physical thing or a virtual thing for everyone. So what does it mean Right, like how how do you do it? We're like, all right, cool. We sold you. You want to do this? How do you do it? I want to share with you um, something I've learned kind of recently. So first of all, Hector's been in the accessibility space for 25 years. I've been in the accessibility space for four months. Uh, I come from the developer world. I am a C C++ developer. I've worked on five versions of Windows, including Hololens, and I recently joined our central accessibility org because I think it's probably the coolest area of technology on the planet, more than mixed reality or quantum. I know. It just touches everything, right? Then I can meddle and be a dev across all of our Microsoft products, 1400 of them, which is really, really fun. So the first thing I learned when I joined the accessibility team is the spectrum of disability is really broad. So I'd love to go through it with you and share with you some of the things I've picked up on that I thought was, were really interesting. Right now, we're looking at a slide uh, with the spectrum on it. First thing you're going to look at is visual. Visual disability is exactly what you think of. It's people who are blind, people who may be having vision loss. So anyone who wears glasses, like Hector's wearing glasses, I'm wearing contacts. Many of us wear glasses and contacts. Guess what? We have a disability. Glasses were one of the OG assistive tech, right? Sunglasses, also an assistive tech. One thing that is fascinating to me is the sheer number of men who have color blindness. Did not know that one in 12 men have color blindness. Did not know that most of my male colleagues over the course of the past few years have been color blind. Um, when we put up charts that are red and blue, they have no idea what they're saying. They nod knowingly, they have no idea what it's saying. Very interesting. Next category, hearing. So this is folks who are deaf, like our boss, Jenny. Uh, she communicates through, she communicates through, you know, just communicating, but she lip reads, but also uses a sign interpreter. And it's one of those fascinating things where you forget all the time. So I'll say, oh, I'll give you a call. I'm like, no, I won't. I will call, give you a Teams call. It's, it, you just don't think about it after a while because, she has set up her assistive tech situation to the point where it just works for her, right? She is an original hacker where she's been able to figure out exactly how to use technology to maximize her productivity, which is awesome. Another part of uh, hearing disability are people who are experiencing hearing loss with age, with time, with listening to loud music, you know, all of those things that we weren't supposed to do and we did. From my previous job, one of my former colleagues actually reached out and said, I had to get hearing aids. He's in his 30s and he had to get hearing aids. My father-in-law in his 80s has to get hearing aids. So it is quite prevalent. Um, it's not like, oh, this is a very, very tiny group of people. It is very, very prevalent. It's going to become more and more prevalent. All of us are going to age into this in some way or another. The third one is cognitive, and I'm going to skip that and come back to it in a second. Fourth one is speech. So this is 
anyone who may have a speech impediment, like the president of the United States, Joe Biden, he has a stutter, which he's very open about. And I appreciate that he talks so openly about it. Um, and then that one movie in the UK, The King's Speech, you know, it was all about this topic, which was so fascinating. And of course, people who may um, be nonverbal and speak through an, an interpreter or technology or some other third party sort of way. The fourth one is mobility. This is people who may use a wheelchair. This is might be people who might use a, a walker or a cane, or you might be like me and have arthritis in your knees and really be struggling with the steps in Venice where I am right now. Uh, Hector, by the way, you and I talked about this earlier. There are no ramps in Venice like anywhere. So when people are lugging Amazon boxes up and down those streets with those bridges and hills, they're like carrying them. It's pretty intense. Uh, there's a lot of very fit people in Venice because they're having to lug like 800 pounds of vegetables from here to there or boxes or it's really interesting um, how ramp free Venice is. And I just look around like, how is anyone getting around just even the older population? I'm thinking more about that than anything else. How is the older population managing with these stairs? Okay, so the last two that I'd like to talk about are speech or uh, cognitive and neural. Cognitive is what we call neurodiversity. Uh, I fall into this category. People who have cognitive disability slash neurodiversity may have ADHD, may have dyslexia, may have autism. Fascinatingly, many people in my generation are getting diagnosed now because their children are getting diagnosed. Turns out that when you go get your kid diagnosed, the neurologist will often say, hey, let's test your parents too. And then a bunch of people in my age demographic are saying, I just learned I have autism or I just learned I have ADHD. My kid and I are, you know, learning dyslexic tools together. I said, yeah, this is a very, very common thing that's happening. It's not that there's more people with disabilities now. It's that they are actually being diagnosed. Again, it's really a U.S. and Western Europe thing. Um, it is not common to diagnose for most of these things in Africa, Latin America, or Asia. And mental health, you don't talk about it in many parts of the world either. That's the last category, neural. And I would say this is probably the one that's the most prevalent in the world. Um, given the last 18 months or so, or however long we've been in this pandemic, is there anyone here who has not been touched by mental health in some way or the other? I have. All of the Olympic athletes have, all the celebrities have, Britney Spears, Simone B, Naomi Osaka, Michael Phelps, all of them, right? Everyone is openly coming out and talking about mental health right now. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful because we have to destigmatize some of this. Everyone experiences mental health stuff at some point or another. It is normal. Mental health is physical health. It's like catching a cold. It happens. So sometimes it's situational. Uh, like seasonal, sometimes it's permanent, but it falls into the spectrum of disability. And I love that we're finally openly talking about it. So what is disability anyway? Um, I really like this definition. Disability is not something wrong with the person. It's actually something wrong with the environment. It's a design problem. It's a tech problem. I love tech problems. It is a mismatch between someone's abilities, whether it's you know, 2020 vision, <laughs> lack of 2020 vision and the expectations of the world. Mismatch between your abilities and the way the world is set up and designed. It is a human made problem. Like the the line that I really like and I can't remember who said it, but I really like it, which is wheelchairs do not make the building inaccessible. The stairs do. What we're looking at here is a photo of a young woman in a wheelchair. This is at a fashion show that I was at about a month ago. Uh, we were showing my pieces. This was a different fashion show and all of the models had you know, gotten dressed up. They built this runway, a uh, big platform that's a runway. And some of the models were in wheelchairs, like this young woman in the pink shirt in the front. One thing they hadn't thought of was building a ramp to go onto the runway. So the models had to all walk around the runway rather than on top of it. So. What's inaccessible? The lack of ramp, not the wheelchair. So that is disability in a nutshell. One thing that Hector shared with me earlier is the Guggenheim. Um, 
I did not know this, but this building is built with only ramps. So no stairs, nothing inaccessible. It's built with only ramps. This is awesome for people in wheelchairs, but also people with arthritis, but also people pushing baby strollers, but also people who may be, you know, kind of klutzy and may fall on stairs, like also me. It's just cool design. And I was wondering, like, why don't we do this more? Why don't more airports have this? Why don't more apartment buildings have this? I love it. It's fantastic. Imagine, like, moving. How much easier would this be? A lot easier. How much easier would Venice be? A lot easier. I actually did see they're smoothing out some sets of stairs to make like this ramp like surface, which is very interesting. I took a picture. I will share it. So. If you are the kind of person who wants to help lots of people make a big impact and make some good money, designing for accessibility is actually a really, really good hack especially if you're a tech person, okay? I'm a tech person. I look at this from a tech point of view. There's nothing like overly emotional about it. It's like, here's a technical problem. I want to solve it. And I like to solve for disability. And when I look at the spectrum of disability, as we're showing on this slide, it goes from permanent all the way to situational. So let's talk about one of these examples. Permanent, let's look at hearing as a, as a factor. You may have permanent hearing loss, like you might be deaf, like our boss Jenny. You might have temporary hearing loss, like you've got an ear infection. You know, how many of you have had that and you're like, what? Or you're on a plane and your ears are closed and you can't quite, you know, everything is a little bit muffled. You have to put those drops in and do all of it. Or you might be in a loud bar, right? Again, you're in a sports bar. You're trying to have a conversation with your friend across the way. No idea what they're saying. So you just kind of nod and smile and you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Bartenders do this all the time. I've been a bartender. You just nod and smile and say, so interesting, a lot. You have no idea what the other person is saying, zero. That's situational. So when you design for disability, keep in mind the whole spectrum. Don't only design for temporary and don't only design for permanent. Though if you design for permanent, it's probably gonna work for temporary. The thing to know about customers, right? Customers, have very different lived in experiences than you. This is a picture of our leadership team minus Hector because he was in the UK at the time that we took this. Our leadership team has very different lived experiences. We've got people who use wheelchairs, people who are neurodivergent, people who are deaf, people who are vegans, I know, and uh, people like Hector in the UK, so they're of a different time zone. But customers have very, very different lived in experiences than you. They live with different internet speeds. They have different phone habits. They have different spending habits. So before you go and you get enthusiastically set up to design for someone with disability or accessibility in mind, uh, you have to get to know the human. So it goes back to the fundamental principle of inclusive design, which is do not create for people. Co-create your products and services with your customer at the design phase. Don't ship it and then be surprised that it didn't work. I worked on Windows 8, so ask me how I know about shipping products that do not work for people. I know a lot. Once we ship Windows 8, we spent 10 years trying to fix it. So don't be Windows 8 about it. Be like Windows 10, Windows 11. Be accessible by design, co-create from the beginning. So how, how, how do we go about thinking about this? Keep in mind that people with disability are all around you. It might be you, it might be someone in your house, it might be someone in your close friend circle. One in two people are impacted by disability, neurodiversity, or mental health, right? And it all depends on what you're going to design for. We were having a conversation, Hector and I, earlier on um, how do you design for mental health? And his favorite example is the Microsoft To Do app, which is Lists are overwhelming. People love to make lists, but when you see a list of 25 things, you say, that's overwhelming, you close it and you don't do it. But Microsoft To-Do is great because it parses out that day's to-dos. You only have three things on your list. You do them, check, 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 with a loud checking noise. Very satisfying to check those off. And suddenly you're like, yeah, I built something that dramatically reduces anxiety in my users. That is how you design with mental health in mind because it helps people who might have 
you know, anxiety problems, but it actually helps everybody because who doesn't like the loud clicking noise when you check something off? Everyone likes it. Um, next. Really understand what, how disability manifests itself to your person, right? To the person you're designing with, to the people you're designing with. A lot of people think they understand dyslexia. They're like, oh, dyslexia, you know, it's for kids and they can't read. Like, I can read this map just fine. I can read a book just fine. But you put words on a screen, no idea what it says. I'm not reading these slides right now. I am looking at the picture and looking at the shape supports. My world looks like this. The first line will look like gibberish to you because that's what it looks like to me on a screen. When I go to host big conferences and they put a teleprompter up and they're like, okay, read that. Like, what? So we have to set up a rig where I hook up immersive reader to a earpiece, hide it over here so no one can see it, reads it to me and I relay it back. It's a very complicated process, but guess what? That's what technology is for. This is what my world looks like. So you have to really understand what someone's world looks like from their point of view before you can go design for them. I really love this quote by our colleague Dave Dame. He is the director of Surface Hardware at Microsoft. He was part of the uh, release of the Surface Adaptive Kit. Um, Surface Adaptive Kit, I'll dig into a little bit in a second, but they're the set of stickers and pulls knobs that are great for people with disabilities to use for Surface devices. He says, we're all going to be uh, disabled someday. Just some of us beat you to it. And I found that to be really, really interesting um, because he's right. We are um, all going to, we're all going to deal with it, right? And if you're a control freak like me and Hector, then you want to have a hand in the in in the future that we're all going to live in. So businesses that create accessible products actually do really, really well. Um, they have 86% higher revenue. Their net income is nearly double and employee retention is nearly 90%. So it's a very, very interesting thing where if you do good, you do well. Yes, it's a good thing to do for the world, but actually for your bank account, it's also a really, really good thing to do. That study, by the way, is from uh, Accenture. It's called the, uh, the Disability Advantage. You can look it up. It's from 2018, very fascinating study. We have some examples from Microsoft itself, the Xbox controller and the Surface Adaptive Kit. Whenever we come out with something that is designed with disability in mind, but applies to everyone, we get great news in the press. Uh, we get tons of good reviews. People go out and buy it. We get ads, we get commercials, the sales of like Azure go up, all sorts of fun benefits happen. Most recently we released the, uh, the kit and the headlines were beautiful. They were like the Surface Adaptive Kit reminds us of the importance of accessibility in tech. Um, Surface Adaptive Kit makes laptops more accessible. Xbox controller helps players with disabilities game more comfortably. So it's just really, really interesting how when you build for disability, you just get really, really good feedback from people across the board. Xbox has a great saying, when everyone plays, we all win. And I think it's one of the most beautiful ways to explain inclusiveness, um, where if you have a chance to build an inclusive product or a non-inclusive product, build an inclusive product, because why would you not build an inclusive product? We're not the only company who does this. Uh, Apple actually does quite a good job. And recently when they released the Apple Watch with the gestures, so these are for people who may squeeze to, you know, have the watch do something and then rotate to do something else without reaching over. A lot of people are like, oh, this is just convenient when you just want to use one hand. And Tom Warren's like, this is why I got into tech in the first place. This is one of, I love seeing the focus that tech companies are putting on accessibility. So lots and lots of focus on this and it's gonna keep happening. So now's a very, very good time to uh, join this train. This is This kind of thing has been going on for a long time, right? Hector had some fabulous examples of designing for disability. I love the example of audiobooks. 
audiobooks were invented for blind Americans in the 1930s, but now Amazon has uh, bought Audible, which who are one of the mainstream companies and made them mainstream for everyone. So you're going for a walk, a run, driving, Audible. And it's just such a good way to consume books uh, quickly, especially in the author's own voice. It's a very, very interesting experience, especially for those who love podcasts and those who like sort of passively listening while they're doing something. Some other examples. Um, this picture is fun. This is of Hector with these uh, British Sign Language boards it, all throughout London, throughout the London train stations. And it says, the more accessible you are, the more innovative you can be. And it's said in sign language. So it's pretty cool to run into these boards. They rolled them out just as I showed up, just saying, coincidence, I think not. Um, I learned all this information recently. The first typewriter, you know, old school clunky typewriter, it was invented by Pellegrino Turi to help his blind friend write legibly. His friend, the Contessa, used to write him letters, uh, but she started to go blind, so she couldn't write anymore. And he invented her this keyboard that presses keys into a piece of paper so she could continue to communicate with him. And now without that, none of us would have jobs. SMS was invented by this Finnish man and his crew, Matty and friends. They had initially invented this so deaf folks could communicate with each other and with non-deaf people. And now SMS is, you know, makes the world go around and it's how the top way people reach you um, calling. So five years ago, now texting, it's the only way. And of course the internet. Vinsurf, now at Google, super cool guy, hard of hearing, researcher in the 70s. Uh, other people, when they used to share their research, they would call their colleagues on the phone and share. But because he was hard of hearing, he couldn't do it. So he invented the internet protocol to be able to package up his research and send it to his colleagues. This is why we work. It's why we have jobs, because of inventions with and for people with disabilities. It is no surprise that people with disabilities have tremendous economic power. We have over a trillion dollars of economic power because there's a lot of us. There's a lot of us and we love technology. We love to spend money on technology and we love to tell people about it. We're deeply connected. Every dyslexic person in Microsoft reaches out to me asking me for my best hacks and I tell them my best hacks. I guarantee that if you've got a blind friend who's very influential, every single person they know who's blind will be also using your product. Deeply connected to each other, very technical, extremely bland, brand loyal. This is a good audience to get. So how do we do inclusive design? Like, what does that look like? We ask five questions. Ready? One. Who am I building this for and with? So Surface Adaptive Kit Story. Sur Surface team, they have this thing called the Inclusion Lab. They had people who have bought the Surface laptops in the past come in. And for a segment of people with disabilities, they looked at their devices and saw all the different augmentations these folks have done. They have uh, put glue dots on specific keys so it's easier to find them. So many blind users want to find uh, F12 easier, so they put a glue dot so they can run their finger over the key and find it easy. I personally put blue nail polish on my print screen button because as a dyslexic person, I can't see it easily, but I can see the blue key very easily. I can find it. And Surface Team realized like, wow, when you augment your device, often the manufacturer won't take it back if there's a warranty issue because it's like you've augmented your device. So they said, what if we come up with a better solution for this? And that is how the Surface Adaptive Kit, which are like the raised stickers and the knobs and pulls, that's how it was, it, that's how it was born from a co-creation activity. The way I do this is focusing on the specific human. Um, who is the human? What is their name? So if I were to go and design, say, teams, for example, uh, then I would say, all right, who's the first person I would design teams for? I would design it for someone who is blind, who is blind, and on my team is blind. How would she use Teams? Well, requiring video on is silly, so don't make that the first most important priority. So you start with the specific human, figure out what their needs are, gather the requirements, right? Don't ask them for the solution, gather the requirements. For her, it would be screen reader capable, make sure that there's a transcript that she can follow up on afterward, make sure that there is voice, yes gather the requirements. 
once you observe uh, with your team how people are using your product from the design phase, you'll have a very good idea of whether you're on the right track or not. Again, start at the design phase. Don't make a product and test it with people with disabilities because you're going to be disappointed and they're going to say, yeah, it doesn't quite work and then you're going to be sad, heartbroken. Start at the design phase. Second, figure out who can experience your product. Who are you purposefully including? Okay, so you've built for one, now extend to many. Once I've built teams for someone who is blind, yes, there's voice capabilities, there's transcriptions. How would I build for someone who's deaf? For someone like our boss, Jenny, she would need a sign interpreter. So make sure there's a place where video can be on where she can observe the sign interpreter. Make sure you can pin that so she can always have the sign interpreter on screen. Make sure there's captions. Make sure those captions get saved in the transcript. Make sure are in the video recording. Um, maybe a blurred background, right? Hector's got a cool demo he'll show you, but this is how you do inclusive design, built for one, extend to many. Some of the things that are kind of baked into Microsoft products that I would love for everyone to use is the accessibility checker. It, you'll find it in pretty much every single Office tool, Outlook, Word, Excel, PowerPoint. At the very bottom, there's a little bar that says accessibility, and it'll say either accessibility investigate or accessibility good to go. Just click on it and it will tell you, like put all text on these, uh, on these images, uh, figure out the sort order, the color contrast might be off. It kind of does the work for you, which is nice, so you don't have to sit around and mess with it and just solve the problems. This is a really, really good way to make sure that whatever you're creating, the document or the presentation or the email can be experienced by as many people as possible. Also, good life hack, if you put captions on your videos or put image descriptions or uh, alt text on your images on social media or websites, your SEO goes up, up, up. I know this because I run a fashion line and before I joined the team, I didn't have alt text on my images and I didn't have captions on my videos. After I joined the team, I did that so people on my team could see my fashion line, it could consume my fashion line. Our SEO went through the roof. So I had this really interesting eye opening moment like, oh, wow, this is actually really good for business for everyone. That's how the Google search crawler and the Bing search crawler work is by metadata. Exactly how screen readers work. Fascinating. All right. Uh, Hector, do you want to talk about accessibility insights a bit? Yeah, so this yeah, is the rigor, rigor of accessibility. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about kind of the design opportunity of accessibility, but what you've just stumbled across there really with the accessibility checker and all of those things that you got reminded of, these are kind of, these are what we call, this is, these are the, this is the building blocks for a truly accessible experience. So they might not be the exciting things, but if you are hacking on this project, make sure that you're actually doing rigorous testing of your product using testing tools through the process. So if you're building a piece of software, if you're building a web portal, you can run open source accessibility checking from Microsoft's Accessibility Insights. Uh, I'm sorry, this slide, I thought I'd updated it, but it's accessibilityinsights.io. Uh, go there and you'll be able to essentially download a plugin for your browser, either Chrome or Edge, uh, or download a piece of software onto your device where you can essentially test any software that's in your environment for accessibility. It also allows you to test for Android apps that you're building. So regardless of what tool you're building, and you might be aiming at things like dyslexia, yeah, or you might be aiming at uh, a food bank, yeah, you know, mem remember that tool that you're building, make sure it's functionally accessible. There's the exciting bit, the design challenge of, of inclusive design, but then there's what I call the rigor. You know, make sure that your tool really works across the board for color contrast, labels for people who are blind, scan order, et cetera, et cetera. You're not getting away with just saying, I'm building great, a great inclusive product, unless you actually show that it is uh, functionally accessible for people with disabilities. Exactly. And that is how you make sure you're not unintentionally excluding people, right? When you're building your solution, first you build for one, second you extend to many, third you ask, who am I unintentionally excluding? And one of the ways I do this is just make categories of customers right on across the disability spectrum. And I'm like, all right, are we covering people who are blind? Yes, covering people who are deaf, covering neurodivergent. Often there's tension. 
because with some groups, they want all the settings. For neurodivergent people like me, a lot of settings is totally overwhelming. Don't want lots of settings. So how can you build an experience that works for both? And here's the secret. You're not going to build the same experience for everyone. Not everyone has to participate in the same way, but everyone should have a way to participate. OK, what does that mean? That means that you look at something like Windows where you go to the log on screen. Everyone should be able to log in. Yes, whether you're using a screen reader or not, whether you choose to set up all your settings right away or you say skip for now and do it later, whether you choose express settings or I want to choose my own. Everyone has a way to participate to do the task. Make sure everyone can do the task. They will have many different ways to get to the task, but do the task. You can also turn on captions or um, voice in, in the login screen for uh, people who are blind. So there are many ways to participate, but everyone should be able to participate. That is how make sure you're not unintentionally excluding. Fourth thing, turn things on by default. I would say this is probably like the biggest issue out there. People do not know what is available. Like, for example, many people had no idea that you've got captions on in Teams. I turn on subtitles in every presentation I give. Hector just showed me this Teams Live thing that I'm like, oh, cool. So now everyone can turn it on for themselves in a language translation, which I really like. Um, I didn't know that. I had no idea. I use Teams every day. Did not know. Some people didn't know that you can automatically generate a transcript and have a download. Didn't know. Some people didn't know you could look at the recording at 2x speed. Didn't know. Uh, it's just not having things obvious, hiding things, uh, putting it in some random setting somewhere. Don't do it. When we turned on accessibility checker by default, the usage went, guess what? High. Unsurprisingly, it went high. Now it just runs by default. Before you had to do like the shenanigans of go to some toolbar, go over here in the corner, find it. It's like the speakeasy of settings. Now it's just there at the bottom. Click. There it is. It's always running in the background doing work for you. So turn them on, make it obvious. And fifth one, it's my favorite part, which is what does your iteration lo loop look like? This is your basic engineering practice. Like, what does the experiment look like? What does the feedback look like? What does the iteration look like? Again, start at the design phase. If you're building someone, something for someone who's blind or deaf or has limited mobility or is dyslexic, come up with the design sheet of paper, describe it to them, show them whatever, and talk about, is this going to fulfill the requirement, yes or no, and maybe co-create with them. Before you start writing code and making apps, make sure your design works. Iterate loop, right? This is how we build tech products. Uh, we write code on a Monday, we ship on a Wednesday, we get feedback by Friday. Iterate again, we do it week over week. This is Windows, this is Office, it's Azure, it's Power Platform, across the board. Um, this is how we shipped Windows 10 and Windows 11 and every single version of Office for the last five years. So just do it, it works, co-create, do you want to talk to them about Teams? Yeah, I would. Look, if you think about Microsoft's kind of latest big product, you know, the thing that's really taken the world by storm, particularly in the last two years, it is packed full of features that support people with disabilities, including things like the background blur that's available in Teams. Uh, the background blur that I've got on now and the captions that are available were designed by a deaf engineer in the Teams team, looking at lip reading. It's incredibly exhausting to jump between lots of different people on a call, but if we can blur those backgrounds and take out some of that fine detail, it was just a much nicer experience. If we think about that extension to many, what happened after that? Well, the blurred background appeared, but then what happened is we got to presenter view in Teams. Donna, you know you can now sit in front of your slide because you've got this shape of the person that can just be superimposed over your content. That came on the on the on the back of the first bit of work. So it's a, it's a great example where yeah we started with a disability setting and accessibility accommodation, but actually the world saw it and just said well actually we can take that bit of code and start to augment it and use it in different ways. The other thing that we see with Teams live events is yes we've got speech to text for the captions, but we've also got translation. So during a live event in Teams. You as a company can be holding your company-wide event, 
but you'll be speaking in English here and it will be available in Korean uh, on, the, on the opposite side of the world because this technology is built in. OK, so closed captions recognizing it's not just for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, but it's really supporting people with different languages as well. That confidence in the language translation has now led to us being able to live translate PowerPoint slides in a Teams meeting, which is honestly, I've used that so many times in the last few weeks and it is so empowering. We're not saying everybody has to see those slides then in Korean. Yeah, what we're saying is every single person around the world connected to my slides can listen with, the, with their own personal captions. Yeah, and they can translate the slide content into their preferred language right there in the tool. This is the cloud. This is the cloud. This is Azure Cognitive Services as we apply it to our own product. Turning to things like sign language, you can pin a sign language interpreter and you can uh, fit to frame to make sure you see the whole person. But what you can also do is a, as a manager in inverted commas in the call is you can put the spotlight on yourself to make sure that your whole team are looking at you during the presentation. So pinning came out of the need to support people who are deaf or hard of hearing with their sign language interpreters or to lip read. And suddenly everyone's going, well, hang on, there are other applications where we can, where there are needs to pin and spotlight a particular person in the call. Now it's one of the hero features uh, of Teams. Shortcut keyboards, this is shortcut keys. This is the rigor. It's also important to recognize that whenever you design a product of any type, having shortcut keys allows people with physical disabilities or people who are blind to navigate really rapidly. But I don't know about you, Donna, but I am totally old school. I still use control escape sometimes instead yes. of the Windows key because that's, you know, I love my shortcut keys. I mean, you know, I love uh, pasting unformatted into Teams control shift V. I know these keyboard shortcuts. So do take the time to put keyboard shortcuts into your into your software because fundamentally they will 100% empower people with disabilities. I guarantee you that. But what you'll also then get is other people using your product more efficiently, you know, and loving the product and loving how productive they can be inside the tool that you create. Some of this has started to find itself into Windows. I just wanted to kind of talk about the, the modernization of technology. So when you see uh, things like screen captions and great quality of transcription inside a Microsoft product, that is available to all of you through Azure. Yep. You can build your own speech to text tools. The new touch keyboard in Windows 11 has the speaker right there on the uh, on the keyboard because it's recognized that so many people are now using speech to text in their daily lives. Go into any street and watch how people are using their mobile phones. They are no longer typing away there. They are transcribing or sending voice messages. So the modern computing experience is becoming what I would call multimodal by default. If you're building a business tool, you cannot anymore just say people are going to use a mouse and a keyboard. If you're using a consumer tool, you better not just do it for, for keyboard and mouse because people are using it with touch screens, with voice, through their phones. We have to think about that input and those different input methods for individuals through Azure, speech to text, text to speech, using natural language processing for search of functions. All of these are things that are built into the Azure cloud that you can start embedding into the tools that you build. When you do it with a lens of inclusion, you're already thinking about that wider audience though. Yeah, but actually the lens of inclusion is a great way to win hearts and minds and get buy-in. It's amazing to me as I promote accessibility around the world, how many people let us in the front door to talk about accessibility, disability, inclusion. Suddenly we're talking about digital transformation and we're looking at ways for them to modernize their thing. When you see how we apply AI, cognitive services and cloud to Microsoft products, all of those experiences are open to you as developers as well. Talking about development tools, Donna. Yes, so these are my favorite tools. Um, that's Hector, by the way, who's an accessibility ninja. In the uh, so there are a lot of tools for developers. Um, accessibility insights, as we mentioned earlier, if you're building a website, building an Android app, run it. It'll give you a whole bunch of input that you can do right away. 
And it's a good way for you to just not have to go learn a bunch of rules and check the contrast yourself. Just use it. It's an open source tool. We keep it up to date. We take updates on it once a month. There's always new things showing up in it. Um, check out some of the accessibility offerings in VS Code. So if you click on that link, I guess we'll send you the stack. And you can find all of the accessibility settings for Visual Studio, uh, things like brackets, dark mode, uh, specific font, spacing. As a neurodivergent person, the spacing matters a lot to me. And I have my Visual Studio set up in a very, very different way than the way it's demoed. But if you look at other neurodivergent people, they'll have their set up in a very similar way. I like my brackets on separate, separate lines, not on the same line. Um, there are, uh, if you're a low code developer, we are actively, actively trying to build a PAR platform as the most inclusive low code toolkit on the planet. Now, what does that mean? We want to make sure that you can build accessible power apps and we want to make sure you can build power apps accessibly. So we've done a demo for Ignite where we're building a power app with a screen reader to show that it is possible. And we also have a bunch of tips and tricks here on how to make uh, your power app, whichever one you generate, whichever one you create, accessible with the right contrast and the ratios and, and such and such. And that last link is a great um, presentation. It's about 30 minutes about programming for accessibility. How do you get Azure Immersive Reader embedded into your apps? Um, I recently am working on getting Immersive Reader into my website because I use it all the time. And I'm like, you know what? I want more people to know about Immersive Reader. So I'm going to put it into my website, which you can do. And finally, do you want to talk about seeing AI and such? I do. I just want to give it to as an example of unique innovation. So, yeah, we talk about the cognitive services that are available to you all. We talk about how we're making our products more accessible. We're seeing partners across the world think about how they embed some of this inclusion accessibility into their tools and allow us to showcase some of the work that they're doing. But if we look about see, at seeing AI, seeing AI was developed by Sakib Sheikh. He's a blind developer at Microsoft. He looked at the world of artificial intelligence and thought, this can 100% augment my human experience. He designed a number of tools that had until that point been unthinkable for someone who was blind. So handwriting. People have been able to read text through apps, uh, through, through, through voiceover, speak out loud, essentially, of written text. But for years, people with disabilities, with vision disabilities, have been unable to read handwriting. He designed a specific tool. He built net new AI to access that handwriting. And then what happened was, of course, the office team pick it up and say, wow, there's loads of people wanting to capture handwritten notes. If you go into the office app on your mobile phone, you now have the option to capture handwriting. Think of what that would have been like at school, Donna. Uh, <laughs> yeah. with dyslexia, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, you know, all of that handwriting that you're expected to capture, yeah? It's suddenly becomes manipulate. Uh, there's not even a word, something that you can manipulate. <laughs> I was going to make up a brand new word there, Donna. Uh, <laughs> but, but these are net new tools where people are actually saying, the technology I need actually doesn't exist yet, and the mainstream are then going to pick it up. Edge detection in taking photos, barcode scanning with, or with audible orientation. All of these are net new technologies that Sakib's team generated for the blind community. And now they're being picked up by other product teams across Microsoft and beyond. Mm -hmm. The very fact that he recognized that he could not depend on a bandwidth or connectivity to instantly read text on a letter meant that he designed an AI on the edge. So we're always talking about what's a good AI on the edge example, non-connected AI on the edge, OCR, optical character recognition to speech for people that are blind. So essentially, if someone cannot read, you point your phone at it, it reads it for you. Well, that doesn't just help people who are blind. That's gonna help people who cannot read around the world in the future. So there's this great opportunity for us to keep an eye on what's happening in the disability space. Look at these brand new innovations and recognize the legacy and the history of disability innovation changing the world. The typewriter, Donna, the touch screen, all of those things that you talked about earlier came from the world of disability. You as Hackers, problem solvers, designers, brains <laughs> out there thinking about what you're trying to create 
really can start to think about things that will change the world. And this is what we hope you're able to achieve. Absolutely. Keep in mind, inclusivity is innovation. Go forth. Happy hacking. Thank you. So I think we've got time for a couple of questions, Gina, yeah? Thank you all very much. Does anybody have any questions? I know we are over time. Uh, we're if over. anybody has Excellent. any questions, and we'd love to take them. I'm reading out the chat. Yeah, if you could read that out loud for us, Hector. Yeah, so I've got a question here. There, there are lots of areas, but what kind of new product can we develop? This is a blank sheet of paper, OK? Mm -hmm. Uh, anything that impacts the inclusion of people with disabilities uh, mm -hmm. across any of the SDGs, uh, across any of the UN's SDGs, as, as, as we sh shared at the start, you can work on. So there's, you know, there are no rules to this as such that I know of. Adi, you can tell me otherwise. But fundamentally, what we want people to do is, say, is look at the world around you. Look at the exclusion that exists in education, in retail, in health, in any aspect of life where people with disabilities may be excluded what can we do to build net new tools that will drive more inclusion? Can I ask a follow up question of that, Hector? Please. Are there any areas in the way that Donna had those different areas, the different categories that we see that have not been traditionally or I guess uh, serviced um, um, deeply is there any net new emerging category that we see across that spectrum? <laughs> They're all being worked on. You know, kind of a billion people on the planet with a disability without somebody kind of ideating about where to go next. The challenge I would argue is what is commercially viable. So when we look at things like the wheelchair climbing, yeah, sorry, sorry, the stair climbing wheelchair, yeah, you know, that, that didn't last. You know, it's very niche, very expensive, not a great business model, I would argue, yeah, okay? Well, the way that the world went was, you know, we're just gonna design more ramps, right? We're gonna, you know, we're gonna actually start putting building code in that makes things more accessible. We're gonna look for, you know, engage with architects rather than engage with wheelchair manufacturers. I think some of those challenges are super interesting. So when we look at things like uh, workplace apps, yeah, biz apps, when we look at things like, uh, library portals, when we look at things like job portals and job boards, yeah, what, you know, where are we seeing exclusion regularly and how can we start to apply technology? One of the things I would 100% ask people to think about is your own part of the world as well. So many of the business models for assistive technology focus on well-funded, well-developed markets where there's government support to get a business off the ground. Some of the things that you might come up with might tackle exclusion in parts of the world that we're not reaching yet. And I think this would be an excellent way. You know, I, I would 100% give a preference to somebody who's thinking about tackling a part of the world where we're not getting to that level of inclusion yet. So please don't think that you have to necessarily start brand new. You might just apply to your market, your world. Yeah. Also, do go net new and maybe think about industry. Yeah. Like, what are the healthcare experiences, the retail experiences, the education experiences that could start to become more routinely accessible if we apply innovation there? Also, think neurodiversity and mental health, because yeah. that those are new areas. There's not like strict guidelines and such around them, but you know what is stressful. You know, this is stressful. And honestly, if something is stressful, it's not accessible. Opening a can used to be real stressful. That's and not. if you're if you're the inventor of an existing product, yeah, you know, if you if you already own a brand, if you already have a product, go back to that lovely quote from Jenny Lay Flurry at the start. If you don't know that it's accessible, it's not. Mm -hmm. So some of these innovations might just be you doing the rigor and finding a way to market your product as inclusive, as accessible. You know, create your market differentiation by saying we've done the rigor, we've made sure that our product works for more people, and adding new features that make this product more inclusive. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Happy hacking. We can't wait to see what you create. Thank you so much, Hector and Donna. Before we close, remember to take a look at our full Hackathon Live event schedule. And tomorrow morning, we have Janine Buzali from the Ashoka Foundation engaging in a thoughtful conversation to uncover how you can be the change maker in yourself and enable internal change making at all levels of your organization. 
That'll be tomorrow at 7 a.m. Thank you all very much for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks so much.